Shortly after Ford of Britain launched their D-series truck range in the spring of 1965, a convoy of these vehicles made a 10,000-mile export demonstration run from London to the Black Sea and back. The trip was a great success as a shop window for British vehicles and a tough test for a new range. A test that involved driving over broken roads up and over the snow-lined passes of the Caucasus Mountains. Then, in the height of summer, one of the vehicles from the Russian trip was loaned to the Oxford University Sahara expedition for another 10,000 miles of travel across the sands of the Libyan and Sahara deserts. In the universities, every summer vacation sees a crop of student expeditions setting off to beat a trail somewhere in the world. They said there's nowhere left to explore, but this didn't deter eight of us who decided on a desert trip. There were two objectives in our plan. We wanted to study a primitive tribe and take medical samples from a people comparatively untouched by Western influences. These were for research work in tropical skin diseases that was going on in the medical schools at Oxford. We also wanted to make an archaeological survey. And we had reports that our particular desert location contained excellent samples of rock paintings and early stone implements. We set our sights on the Valley of Zouar, 1,100 miles south of Tripoli and 700 of these across waterless desert. Zouar lies in the heart of the Tibesti mountain range, a territory of extinct volcanoes which rise to a height of 11,000 feet and cover an area greater than England and Wales. With the Mediterranean coast now 400 miles behind us, we took on the final stocks of petrol and water at Seba and left the tarmac road for the sand and camel tracks to Zawar. The planning had taken much longer than we thought. Two years, in fact, of letter writing and logistics, loans of money and loans of transport, arguments about how to carry 240 gallons of water and 500 of petrol and not get them mixed up. Now, in mid-August, we were actually handling these stores and driving on to our objective. Now, the expedition had really begun. We soon settled down to a regular drill of unloading and loading, stacking our stores so that those most frequently used were easy to get at. Care and sterilization of water became a regular feature, and we'd been warned by old desert hands that whatever we did, we must ration our water with the discipline of an army. Our stocks of tinned food were sufficient for two and a half months, and these two had to be selected with a certain amount of care, if only to vary any monotony in the diet. Regular maintenance of our transport soon became routine, for this couldn't be neglected as we were subjecting our vehicles to the toughest possible treatment. The evening meal became a highlight of the day, particularly after a long drive. At first we took it in turns to prepare the meal, but some cooks are better than others. And after a few protests, we settled down to our regular chef. Desert driving is very different from a spin along the M1. On a clear patch of sand, you can get up speed and pile on the miles. Then you can be swaying and bumping over rocks at speeds little over five miles an hour. With the daytime shade temperature around 120 degrees, we slogged on, thinking only of the cool of the evening and a can of chilled beer.
Earlier, we'd been joined by a hitchhiker, Albert Comelin. Only the desert could throw up such a man. Albert had passed this way 23 years before when serving in General Leclerc's Foreign Legion. A man shrewd and knowledgeable in the ways of the desert, he proved an invaluable assistant and a good friend. When our vehicles bogged down in the sand sea, it was his skill and on-the-spot training he gave us that got us through so many difficult situations. We soon learned the tricks of easing our vehicles through the gears, not staying too long in the bottom ratio for fear of wheel spins and keeping moving once underway, leaving others to bring on the sand channels. A convoy of trans-desert trucks appeared on the scene, heading for Fort Lummi. Friendly greetings were exchanged and everybody joined in to help our vehicles along. Albert was well known to them, as he'd been a driver on this route for a number of years. Clowning about in general horseplay was apparently the normal thing when two groups met in the desert. We slogged on, with Albert showing us how patient we had to be in the endless round of digging out with the sand mats, moving a few yards, digging again, and so on for hour after sweaty hour. <laughs> a welcome sight. We drove into the little garrison town just six days after leaving the last road and petrol point at Seba. Greeted by the Shader Post, we were honoured by a full dress turnout of his troops, who carried out a special ceremonial drill for our benefit. Their life's like something out of a schoolboy's adventure book, and completely removed from the sophisticated ways of the city. As living quarters, we were given half of a semi-detached building. The other half was the local jail. Water was now available in quantity and we enjoyed our first shower and a real clean-up. Prisoners from the jail became willing helpers in getting our shower bath working. Water means life to a community in a desert land. And with water comes food. The village was self-sufficient in the food it grew, but all small luxuries had to come by the infrequent visits of a truck convoy. Irrigation schemes were varied from the ancient system of hauling buckets from a well to a more modern version of a water wheel to raise the precious liquid. Our medical work consisted mainly of removing small samples of skin to be taken back to our laboratories at Oxford. The investigation was connected with studies in various tropical diseases, particularly leprosy. 
At first we had difficulty in persuading volunteers to come forward, but when Albert showed how brave he was and led the way, we soon had a stream of willing patients. We gave them generous donations of cigarettes for their trouble, but soon learned that it wasn't the payment, but the status symbol that counted. Long after we'd collected all the samples we needed, we were being approached by men who demanded to be treated by the English doctors and go away proudly to show the piece of medical tape as a sign that they too had joined the club. These men were a form of local police called gumiers. They willingly posed for pictures, and the fact that the Polaroid camera gave a print in a few seconds was a minor sensation. The camera became very popular when the word got around. One day, we drove out nearly 150 miles to the Trou au Natron, a giant crater four miles wide and 2,500 feet deep. The floor of the crater is covered with a white lake of sodium salt and has two perfect miniature volcano cones in its center. Among the rocky outcrops in the Zoar area, we were rewarded with some excellent finds in the way of Stone Age implements. These were Neolithic, but in remote parts of the world it's hard to tell when such tools were last in use. We were also very excited with the remarkably preserved wall drawings and got to work with sketch pad and camera. The drawings of oxen, giraffes and grazing cattle are clear evidence that this was once a much populated area with fertile land and a more tropical way of life. We put the age of the drawings at between six and 10,000 years. Our friends the Gumiers came on the scene again, this time in their desert rig to set off on one of their camel balloons. work completed, we turned our wheels for home. The journey back was quicker and less eventful. Non-stop across the sand sea, up the narrow tarmac road, we rolled on across Africa, into Spain, and through Europe. It was autumn, and the damp mists were moving into Oxford, when the sunburned members of the expedition did their stores for the last time.